curious this round. From Communitas, we have Brian Scott and Patrick Meyer. So Brian has been involved in concept creation, development, financing, education, and marketing of both non-equity and ownership housing cooperatives since 1982. Patrick Meyer has an extensive background in building ecosystem-based wastewater treatment facilities where the purpose is to clean the water for reuse, so ecological water reclamation. So I'm pleased to introduce both of you. Welcome. You. Here we go. Uh, this presentation normally takes me an hour. I have seven minutes, so let's see how, how well I do. Um, I'm going to hit the high points and then there's information you'll get later. Okay, so this is the first building I was involved in in 1987. It was occupied and it was the first high rise I was involved in, I should say. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. We relied on the engineers, the architects, to tell us how it should work. Very good learning experience. There were some major issues with this building, stack effect, plumbing, noise, corridor pressurization. So 13 years later, we did round two. So round two was Grant and Green, and Grant and Green was done in 2000. And uh, I tell people I locked the engineers out of the room. We discussed how we wanted to solve all of Riverwind's problems, and then we brought them back in. And one of the things we said was, isolate all the units, compartmentalize them, seal all the doors off, and give them all their own heat recovery ventilators. And uh, we achieved 70% energy reduction in heating uh, in this building. But we weren't satisfied with that, so we then went on to bigger and better. So this stat I have to share with everybody because it was a key point for me in terms of motivation. Most housing built today still uses 80s technologies. And I think this is the elephant in the room. We've talked a lot about the changing technologies and how we're advancing and so on and so forth. But when it comes to buildings, residential buildings in particular, but even commercial buildings, things are not changing as fast as they need to. Bob Hawksworth showed us the slide earlier. A building that was built in 2007 was using more energy per meter than many of the other buildings out there that were built in 64. Where's my slide? Okay, so let's move forward now. I've seen this one. Okay, moving on. This is what we're having to build in in Edmonton. High of 35 is minus 35 as the low. So we have quite a range. And so I'm going to tell you a bit more of the story here. So this is our first design iteration, and this was in compliance with the zoning bylaw that we had at the time. And basically, we have buildings all over the site. Then we got money from uh, CMHC and uh, Enercan, 480,000 to do research. So we held a charrette. And out of that charrette came these two ideas. One, well, first off, that we would hit a target that's the passive house target. And if you're not familiar with what that is, You'll have to Google it. I'll tell you a bit more later, but I'll, it's essentially a very, very low energy efficiency target, 90% greater energy efficiency. So we decided there were two approaches to get there, a passive approach and an active approach. So this was the second iteration of the design. All the buildings are pushed together at the back. The north corner uh, at the very top, or I guess on the left-hand side of the screen, is north. So it's a kind of a diamond-shaped site pushed all the buildings together, and then we decided, okay, how are we going to make sure that we have enough heat from the sun to get to all the suites that are on the outside? So the engineers, and I was part of this solution here, if you will, uh, said, okay, well, what about using solar stack effect? And so we created these solar stacks. And the solar stacks are connected to earth tubes. And we have a double-loaded corridor, which everybody knows, and this is one of those things, everybody knows double-loaded corridor is the most cost-effective way to build. And by the way, this was a <clears throat> mechanical engineer's wet dream, if you will, because this thing was amazing. You know, we had, in the summertime, it would naturally ventilate the buildings with no need for electricity. In the wintertime, it would preheat the air, and all of this was being done, and it was being modeled. And then we hit a fork in the road. And we actually had a passive, uh, 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 an engineer with passive housing experience join the team, and he said to me, this double-loaded corridor thing doesn't work. And I said, well, we've got two, not one, but two mechanical engineering firms here saying to me, this is going to work. Two weeks later, he says, you know what, you really want to rethink that. And I said, come on, you know, we're six months into the process, we've spent half of our research funds. And then he says, I'm going to take the plans off to a conference, and when I come back, we'll get some great feedback. So he comes back and he says, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I got great feedback. The, ba the bad news is 
We have to throw the plans out and start all over again. So that's what we did. And we went for the passive house design. So the passive house is, in a nutshell, super well insulated, airtight, and uh, you know, basically a regular house prior to the 80s, uh, you could fit a dog through the hole if you collected all little cracks together. Post 80s home, you can fit a basketball through. Passive house, you can fit a baseball through next. And uh, an energy target, which I'm going to skip. So this gives you an idea of the order of magnitude. This is for heating and cooling. Stock average is around 170. Passive house is 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And this is for total energy. So this is the third iteration. This is a passive house compliant building. And single loaded corridor. Every unit faces south. You can skip past this one. This is just showing how all the, all the units face south. They all have balconies facing south. And some details here, high energy efficiency, heat recovery ventilators, et cetera, et cetera. So the interesting thing here comes up. So we did the passive and active models. So the active model in, used a uh, heat pump system with a uh, geothermal plant. The passive model put the energy or the, the money into the walls, basically. So here's when the rubber hits the road, how much is going to cost. A code plus best practice design. So in essentially, and I hate to break it to you, but the building code in Alberta is not great right now. In fact, uh, Ontario and, and uh, BC have much better codes than ours. But we took our building code and said, look, we're going to incorporate one best practice thing that Alberta says we should do for ventilation. And we use that as our reference building, $60 million. To go from that building to an active passive house certified building was only a 2% premium. To go from code to passive plus was a 3% premium, 3.5%. Passive plus, I, I say, because we actually put green roofs on there, so it's not even a fair comparison. To go from code plus to passive, code plus puts us on a par with Ontario and BC, a 0.89% premium. So basically on par. So to go from built to code to passive house, 90% more energy efficient, 0.89% premium. So what's wrong with this picture? Why are not more people doing this? So here's some other consequences. We eliminated gas altogether. There's no, electricity, there's no gas to this building at all. We still save $60,000 a, a year in fees. Reduce our mechanical system, which means we save substantially, not only in terms of capital costs, but operating savings and replacement reserve savings, which means we can then use the money to secure a green loan. So not only are we going to be close to cost for a regular building, but we can actually take the savings, go to a financial institution, take out a green loan, and actually deliver these units at below cost for 90% more efficiency. So this is uh, from Hunter Lovin's book, Natural Capitalism. And it's, it, we think that, that uh, this project is a perfect example of what they were talking about. The cost savings barrier analysis basically says you start putting money into cost efficiencies and you get to a point where your consultants say there's no point in putting any more money in because there's diminishing paybacks so that just make it not cost effective anymore. But if you keep going, which is what we did, you find all of a sudden huge savings on the other side of that cost effectiveness limit that tunnels you back down through, and that's exactly what was done. So, as if that wasn't good enough, we turned around and said, let's see, well, this is actually not we, the charrette said, what about processing all our wastewater on site? I've listened in great interest to uh, our speakers over the last few days, and um, actually there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, including our, uh, the, the most recent one. I can assure you the water needs not be a constraint for, for growth, and I'll show you why. Um, yeah, before I, before I really start going, I really like the, uh, it was just a very short statement of the inappropriateness of using an industrial process uh, where non -in for a non-industrial application. Um, sewage is not industrial, it's a, it's a natural, a product and we're treating it like it's industrial waste. Uh, not anymore. Okay, so problem. Scarcity. It's not a scarcity problem at all. Uh, the problem is waste. Uh, so um, it's a matter of shifting our mental model to uh, sh shifting our mental model from 
um, of the prevailing worldview that sewage is a waste product that we need to overcome, we need to get rid of somehow, the whole flushing away idea and shifting that over. And the opportunity we have here is the natural product is, that it is, it's actually nutrients for other, uh, other animals. Within a biological system, the waste from one organism is food for another. It only becomes a pollutant if you take that and put it into the wrong location. So we really need to shift the new paradigm to away from treating waste and more using it as a resource that it is. So that's the resource of water as well as a resource of the nutrients in the water. So our present system is taking water out of the, the natural environment, sometimes aquifer, sometimes a river, and bringing it to a treatment plant. So water treatment plant in this case. Uh, very over, overly simplified and bringing it into town. Now this is a single use system, that's what we're used to. We're used to using water just one time and then bringing it back out of town to the, the sewage treatment system. So then it's treated and it comes out to our natural environment again. Now hopefully we have a reasonably good system where most of the nutrients are out of the water, a lot of the cities in Canada don't. What I'm proposing is taking that part of the loop out. So what does that mean? Well, reuse. So once it gets back to the wastewater treatment system, just recycling it back again. Now the problem with that is, is that if your water treatment system, the, your sewage treatment system is outside of town, it becomes incredibly expensive. And that's the fall, uh, that's the, the, the problem with water reclamation. You pump it into town once, you clean it, you bring it back out of town again to clean back into town again. It's, it's too, too expensive to do it that way. So what we need to do, um, so what we need to do is we need to actually bring it into town. We need to be able to do sewer treatment in the city, or uh, better yet, have the water treatment outside the city and a distributed system in the city so that you're locating your sewage treatment close to where you want your water reuse. But who wants that? Nobody wants that in their backyard. I don't want that in my backyard. And that's what sewage treatment looks like right now. Or that, I don't want that in my backyard either. Next slide. How about that? Or the next one. It's a greenhouse, lush plants inside. Next one. You can see the lush plants a little better in that one. That's a sewage treatment system. And so is that. How about that in your backyard? So, well, that's, that's actually on the outskirts. That's uh, Bear River, Nova Scotia. It's a greenhouse, plants inside. That's here in Alberta. There's Cynthia, that's in Brazo County, just outside of Drayton Valley. Speaking of Drayton Valley yesterday. And that's the inside of the Drayton Valley facility. Lots of plants in there. Still looks fairly industrial, but it doesn't need to. You saw in some other slides that you can make it look really green. That's in um, New York State, Rhinebeck, New York. That's a living machine. Next slide. This is what it looks like on the inside. This is a sewage treatment plant. Compare that to the um, not such nice looking facilities that we saw earlier on that we would not want in our backyard. <clears throat> This is uh, an actually an integrated system. On the bottom, if you can spot it, um, got a little greenhouse, uh, a solarium on the bottom of that building. It's integrated right into the building. This is at UBC in Vancouver. Uh, that's, the, that's the interior. The, the tanks just actually before startup so that the plants are really small. By this point, the tanks will, the, 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 um, the um, plants will be uh, overflowing by now. And that's, the, uh, that's also in the, in the service facility. So what we have here is a suggestion of some sort of living treatment system. But this is not unusual. I mean, nature's been doing it for millions, if not billions of years. And it's taking the, um, the biology that normally exists in wetlands and, and uh, putting it indoors. Because while, while our wetlands go dormant, the... Um, the humans creating the waste, or what we th consider waste, don't go dormant during the winter, so you have to move it inside. So sometimes they go by names like living machine, solar aquatics, eco machine. Uh, they, these are all trademarked terms for relatively very similar systems. Some people call them biomimetic, biomimetic systems. I don't. Uh, I don't think they're mimicking bio biology at all. They're just the biology, taking the complex organisms and putting them indoors. So what they all have in common these different trademark systems, is that it's all wetland biology. So you're taking everything from, uh, from the bacteria, the algae, everything, and putting them indoors. And it's the, the complexity of it that really makes it resilient. 
Some people just assume you're just treating gray water because, well, how can biology really deal with this industrial stuff? Because it's still the mindset that this is waste that needs to be gotten rid of, and it isn't. These systems can be engineered to treat just gray water, but really the focus is on black water, taking all of the waste because you need to actually process it. Um, the other uh, thing we need to keep in mind is um, when, I, when I'm talking about wastewater reclamation, this is the difference between uh, reclamation, treatment, and even sewage separation. There's still some cities in, in Canada that are just taking out the big chunks and the rest goes in the chuck. Treatment is done here in Calgary, that's fantastic. I'm talking about reclaiming it and being able to reuse it for flushing toilets, for irrigation, and so forth. One of the beauties of these is, is you can make them look like a garden, and we'll see that in a moment, and that has no odor. Well, how come it, I'm not talking about it has odor and we filter it out. You walk in the middle of these things, they don't smell. And that is because the anaerobic stage is skipped right over, it goes straight into aerobic. Uh, and it's relatable. People can actually understand it. So we're putting these in the middle of a community and people can feel a connection to it. It's their garden. So when they're ready to flush paint or whatever else down the toilet, they'll be thinking in the back of their mind, oh yeah, but this is going to hurt my organic system. And of course, the system's always climate and site adapted, and I'll skip over that due to time. Next slide, please. So this is Station Point Greens. That's what Brian was talking about to begin with. We've got um, the towers on the left-hand side kind of wrapping around the, north, uh, around the top. And then along the, the other end, um, some townhouses. You'll see the LRT line uh, on the far right-hand corner. That's because uh, so, it's a, a block and a half away from the LRT station. Right in the middle, You'll see a little triangular piece right there that looks like a field. Well, that's the, the green roof on top. At the, the extreme north end of that, the top, is you've got a bicycle storage for the community. And just underneath that, you've got the coffee shop. At the very front, you've got my facility. Next slide, please. And that's what it looks like from the front. So it's a solarium. So the south-facing glass, a normal and passive house, passive house design, South face is all glass, so you let in all the sunlight, all the heat, because that's what the biology needs. Next slide. Um, a quick side shot. Um, sure, the next one as well. Um, here you see the green roof. It gives you an idea of perspective and sizes. Next slide. And view from the other side. Okay, so next slide after that. Put a coffee shop in there. Because I want people to be able to, well, you can't see the coffee shop, you just see the space for now. But you can, because I want people to have people sit there when it's minus 40 and snowing outside, and they're sitting there drinking their cappuccino and enjoying the garden. Because that's what it'll look like. It'll just look like a garden. They won't even necessarily know if they're, if they're from out of town that it's a sewage treatment facility. Although I'm planning on putting posters up all over the place and advertising the fact. Um, but really just to be able to enjoy the green space. And it have, having it be functional as well. Water reuse strategy is the very first thing I sit down with, uh, with a client with, is figure out what we want to use water for. And there's so many things that water can be reused for that you don't need drinking water for. You don't need to use drinking water to flush your toilets or to wash aggregate or... So you don't need drinking water for all these. You can actually reclaim water and make it, uh, t take the water, clean it, make it pathogen free. We're talking about water that has no pathogen in it that would be cleaner than what you're taking out of the river and using it for these various functions. I saw this, uh, the, the video from the city of Calgary yesterday, and it was fantastic, I loved it. It was about um, the composting, uh, food scraps and so forth, and turning that into something that's, uh, that was valuable. So it was uh, titled, um, or one of the main phrases was, too good to waste. This is essentially an aquatic compost, and it's doing the same thing. Water is too good to waste. We can't just use it one time. We don't use tin or paper or any of those things that we're recycling right now once, why would we do that with water? So I'm recommending a, uh, a water composting system. I'm just going to, I'll be quick here, but I wanted to share these with you because they were some fairly key insights for us. So I don't know how many of you have seen this before, but there's a saying, when the only tool is a hammer, all problems will look like nails. Uh, there's an engineering corollary in my opinion. When experience and training for heating and cooling design is geared to equipment, every solution will be equipment based. So I think that, I mean, there is an issue here, and, the, and why are we building buildings that are energy inefficient still? And part of the problem is because the system itself is geared towards systems that aren't necessarily optimized for energy efficiency, they're optimized for equipment. 
Now finally, this last slide is, is one which I, I really wanted to share with you briefly because I think it's, a, it's an optimism slide. It's based on an article that was in Scientific American about 20 years ago, and essentially it, it uh, posits the idea, and then it supported it through all the research, that, that essentially change is not linear. Change occurs in these quantum leaps. And essentially the analogy is, is that if, if you look at a, a status quo, it's like a marble in, at the bottom of a trough. And every time we try and change things from one condition here to this other stable condition on the other side, we're pushing this marble up this hill, demanding change, but running into resistance. Fear, uncertainty, um, not wanting to move away from what we already know, etc. And what happens is that marble gets pushed up, runs into resistance, and then comes back down again. But what isn't obvious is that it starts to gain momentum. So that marble is actually rocking back and forth, and every time somebody gives it a push, it gets closer to the top, but we just don't see it. And so we get things like the Blue Box program in Edmonton where we'd been talking about recycling for years, very few people were doing it, they introduced the Blue Box, and all of a sudden they were completely overwhelmed. We're talking about the Iron Curtain where from one day to the next, it was being torn down and nobody saw it coming. And so we are, I think, somewhere in this point right about here. I think we're seeing a lot of movement that's pushing things up. We haven't crested this tipping point, this uncertain area that everybody wants to avoid. And from one day to the next, we'll find ourselves over on this side here. The question is, what's going to push us over the hump? And you've heard earlier about the PACE program. I think financing is a key point. It's not just education. I think, I mean, Hunter said, we have the technology, what we need is the wisdom. I think we need more than just the wisdom, however. I think we need the wisdom, the confidence, and the courage. And whatever is going to give us the confidence and the courage to move forward are gonna be key pieces in this. Thank you very much.